perhaps the most memorable encounter I've had with anyone. Welcome to the Own Your Commerce podcast, where leading experts, brands, and innovators reveal strategies for e-commerce growth. I'm your host, Jay Myers, and this show is brought to you by Bold Commerce. Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Own Your Commerce. Uh, A few days ago, we sat down with three of the absolute best in the industry to discuss trends and things happening in commerce right now and some of the things that have helped make them successful. Two of the folks you're going to hear from today are from very well-respected retail brands, and they share openly of the first-hand experiences they've gone through and the lessons they've learned along the way. So we have Dylan Villad, who is the head of global e-commerce technology at a company I'm sure everyone listening knows, and that's Puma. And we also have Tovi Hilbron, who is the director of digital product experience at one of the most well-respected and iconic brands up here in Canada, and that's Harry Rosen. And last, but definitely not not least, we have one of the most well-respected e-commerce analysts, Joe Sisman from Forrester. He's a senior analyst that understands the nuances of commerce really like not a lot of people. And he has a great way of making big concepts very digestible and relatable. So three absolutely amazing guests. You are going to get a ton from this. Joe is our first speaker today. And just as a reminder, Joe's job with Forrester is to analyze the commerce industry and really get to what makes the best brands win and what technology trends matter to the to e-commerce brands. And so a couple key points I want you to listen for is that Joe talks about is uh, what does the customer journey really look like today and how can brands leverage that information to, to win in the marketplace? What does it mean to be customer obsessed? And then what does a customer obsessed operating model look like or what is a customer obsessed operating model? What is future fit technology? And lastly, what type of technology buyer are you? Okay, let's get into it with our first guest, Joe Sisman, Senior Analyst at Forrester. Here we go. Hi, everyone. All right, let's get started. I haven't slipped on ice in 35 years. And it's a knock-on effect of riding BMX. It tends to get me out of trouble in regular life. Now, my sports psychologist tells me it's called resilience. Now I build my own bikes, I select every part. Sometimes I modify those parts to fit my style, but I also practice a lot and I work with coaches and partners. My contest coach is a three times X Games champ. And what all this adds up to is there's no amount of money that anyone can spend on their gear to outride me. And I'm telling you this because it turns out that that also applies to digital experiences. Now, having digital skills is important because the new connected consumer poses a challenge for brands. Digital business pros like you need to understand how your customers connect across three dimensions, devices, platforms, and channels, and then map your portfolio of experiences so that you're present where your customers are. Now, the model for thinking through your portfolio of experiences is something that we call the 3D connected consumer. So three dimensions, devices, platforms, and channels now define how consumers are connected. And brands need to serve their consumers wherever they are in these complex ecosystems. So you need to take a fresh look at how your customers connect as you craft your technology and platform portfolios. And that's because customers use combinations of devices, platforms, and channels that many firms don't support. You need to understand your customers' digital ecosystems in order to map your portfolio of experiences to how your particular customers connect. And that's not a trivial endeavor. Customer journeys are not simple and brands aren't in control of how the customer goes through that journey. Your digital experience platform is the technology stack upon which you build experiences to support buyer journeys that are non-linear and in the buyer's control. The talent you employ to build these journeys your practitioners, they need flexibility built into their tools because they don't have time to constantly rely on developers. Now, companies of any background and of any size can obsess over their customers. These companies can rebalance their businesses to adapt as new opportunities come into view or to be resilient when things like COVID disrupt their customers' business. And when you do this, you're like a pioneer where being resourceful is more important than being full of resources. Now, What do I mean by more powerful? Well, Forrester has an assessment. 
You answer questions about your business operations, and we categorize you into being along a spectrum toward customer obsession. Now, that spectrum starts off in a stage called customer naive. And as your operations become more aligned around your customer, you become customer aware, then customer committed, then ultimately customer obsessed. And customer obsessed companies grow faster, on average, twice as fast as their competitors that are less customer oriented, even in a recession. Okay, so we're here today to talk about digital experience platforms. So what exactly are they? Well, here's Forrester's definition. Your DXP provides the architectural foundation and modular services for developers and practitioners to create, orchestrate, and optimize digital journeys at scale to drive loyalty and new commerce outcomes across owned and third-party channels. Okay, but what's the benefit of this technology? Well, we can simplify the framing of that question and say that your digital experience platform is how you engage customers. But now let's zoom out for a moment and set some context. The customer obsessed operating model is how you orient your business around your customer. And it contains clear explanations of what good looks like inside the best companies in the world. Now, this is the result of years of research by Forrester, which explains what great culture looks like, what great structure looks like, the characteristics of great people, processes, and technology, and the way that you should be thinking about metrics. Those six levers give rise to your ability to support four operating principles, to be customer-led, to be insights-driven, to be fast, and to be connected. And when you combine that with the right technology strategy, what Forrester calls a future fit technology strategy, then what results is you having new ways of working and new ways that customers can engage with you. Three core drivers, platforms, practices, and partners give rise to three crucial capabilities. The capability to be adaptive, that's changing when you spot an opportunity. It's the capability to be resilient. That's changing when something exogenous like a pandemic or a geopolitical event happens. And the capability to be creative, and that's you being resourceful, even without being full of resources. And again, this comes to life in your business as new ways of working and new ways that customers can engage with you. But you have to do them both because the technology is in service to your customer-obsessed enterprise. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible to be customer-obsessed with only paper and pencil, but I'm saying that you're not on this webinar to learn how to use last-generation business tools. An obsessive focus on customers paired with a future-fit technology strategy results in new ways of working and new ways that customers engage with your business. The technology stack you assemble to deliver digital experiences is your digital experience platform. Now, you will compose your own digital experience platform using parts from multiple vendors selected to deliver your distinct digital strategy. Now, the platform that's right for you doesn't come pre-assembled out of the box. And even if it did, the risk of implementing it all at once is too great for your enterprise. You need ordinary components of a DXP, such as content, customer data, and experience front end. But you likely also need extraordinary components that are specific to your industry, like a travel booking engine instead of a retail cart, an electronic medical record system instead of an order history, and virtual interactive conference streams instead of static videos. So on this slide, let's break down what some of those ordinary components are. Your practitioners work across a range of technology solutions. Enforcer distills digital experiences down to four solutions. Starting at the top, understanding the customer with data, ex creating the experience with content, then tailoring the experience to fit the context with marketing, and finally, delivering value with commerce. By metaphor, this product that you're looking at right here is integrated experience. Hey, I just thought I would pause here to explain what Joe is showing on the screen right now. <laughs> so it makes sense. Uh, on his slide, he has a picture of, if you're old, you may remember these, the TVs that had a built-in VHS and a DVD player and had everything all built in and it was one unit. You picked up the TV and it was all built in. That's what Joe's got on the screen right now. If you're maybe 40 years or older, you probably had one of these or you've seen them. Um, so that's the visual that goes along with what Joe is talking about right now. Okay, back back to it. It's tightly integrated. 
And in certain circumstances, it works great, like in your garage when you're working on your bike, or maybe when you're in a waiting room at an oil change shop. But you're not going to invite your friends over to watch The Mandalorian or the Super Bowl on it. See, as your audience gets larger, that screen isn't adequate. But there's no way to add a larger screen to this DVD player. Oh, and that's right, The Mandalorian isn't distributed on DVD. See, this thing is tightly integrated, but it hasn't kept up to with, the with the times. So what do you do? And what do you buy? Well, think about your needs this way and assess yourself along two axes. That first axis, the vertical one, is your development team expert in traditional on-prem tech for building large monolithic enterprises, enterprise systems? Or are they skilled in microservices, APIs, cloud native, serverless? Then along the horizontal axis, look at your digital strategy. Do you engage customers the, the way most other businesses engage them? In other words, is your digital strategy that you're running pervasive or is it differentiated? Now, if your dev skills are traditional and you're running a digital strategy that's pervasive, then there's probably a software package that's made exactly for you, like that all-in-one TV, DVD, VHS player. But if you have a differentiated digital strategy, then there's probably not one do-it-all system for you. So you're going to need to buy those ordinary and extraordinary components and then compose them into a platform that meets the needs of your business. And since it's 2023, those components will be built on cloud native technology and they'll be built to interoperate with one another following cloud native principles. If it's not a pre-integrated, tightly coupled, all-in-one, do-it-all system for your particular digital strategy, then what exactly is your digital experience platform? Well, my research concluded that an enterprise's digital experience platform is a system of applications and their underlying platforms brought together by various vendors and agencies, bound by APIs and events, connected through good data, which provides the foundation for experiences and apps to be built rapidly on top. Now, over time, as you digitalize more and more of your business's distinct value proposition, you're gonna to need to reach farther and farther into the back office systems that you use to operate your business and bringing those systems into the mix. In other words, going far beyond content and commerce will force you to think about your unification plans, plans from a frame that we call an experience architecture. And your DXP charts the course to front and back office unity under an experience architecture. Experience architecture is your future, but today we're talking about the precursor. We're talking about your digital experience platform. So how do you even get started with this approach to architecting your DXP? Well, here are three starting points for three different states that you might be in. Now, if you're starting from scratch, you need to rethink your DX as a set of competencies and capabilities. Experience design is one of those capabilities. So engage your customer experience colleagues and grasp their CX vision of what experiences your platform needs to enable for the business. Now, if you're rationalizing chaos, employ a product mindset. So deliver your product, your platform, like it's the product your business uses to create all of its digital experiences, because it is. As your platform's usage patterns change, focus your center of excellence on capabilities that get used, reused, shared across experiences your platform delivers. And if you're scaling your enterprise platforms, Compete on merit, not muscle. That's because scaling to you means change to others. So focus on how your platform empowers your colleagues, not on standardization for its own sake. Use a strategist to work with your partners in the business units to help them build their priorities, strategies, and roadmap. And this requires diplomacy on your part. So what do great companies do with their digital experience platform? Well, Customer-obsessed businesses discover what their customers consider to be their most valuable proposition by observing them, by talking to them, and by experimenting with the digital experiences until they see uptake and subsequent improvement in their customers' business. Now, I published a case study about some of these companies recently, and in each case, they had no idea what they were going to build. They started by listening to their customers. They prototyped, and then they worked until their customers' problems were solved, and then they scaled, and then they got the loyalty that drove sales volume. Now, this is the exact opposite of how many companies think about e-commerce, which is, what ads and promotions do I need to run to get conversions? 
Now, these three innovators that I interviewed for that research asked, what are my customers' biggest pains? And can I solve those pains with digital tools? Then the volumes just happened. And this is what we mean when we say that customer-obsessed businesses with a future-fit technology strategy build platforms to deliver their business's distinct value proposition. You simply cannot buy that off the shelf from one vendor. You have to buy components and assemble them. You have to compose them and modify some to fit your style. And you have to make some components yourself. That's why I told you I build my own bikes. My bike is my platform. And you're going to build your platform that expresses your unique greatness as a business. So compose your own digital platform from parts you source from vendors, plus some of your own parts. Use that to digitalize your business's distinct value proposition. Leverage partners along the way and grow by being customer obsessed. Now, your parents were not the digital generation. You are facing generational challenges. Being digital is a generational coming of age challenge. And I encourage you to take this step like it's your rite of pa passage because it's just like riding a bike. Okay, so that's it for me. Thanks for your attention. Now I'm going to throw it over to Dylan from Puma. Okay, next up we have Dylan Vallad from Puma. And as you know, Puma is a massive brand. And with that, they have some extremely interesting challenges. They don't just sell all over the world, but through thousands of online and offline experiences, they have microsites for for many brands. Um, they have digital apps, they have multiple sub brands. And yes, that may be a bit ahead of where you are right now, but that's exactly why they're on the show. They have been through ex extreme growth, faced all kinds of challenges, and they've landed on an approach to how to do commerce in a way that works. And there are a lot of learnings in that. I'll say this, the thing I love about Dylan and Puma is they were doing composable commerce before it was even a thing, before there was a term for it. They just simply did what was best for their business. And today there's a community and a movement around it and there's um, the mock alliance, but, but they were doing it well before any of that because they just did what was best for their business. So uh, it's worth learning from the best and Dylan is absolutely one of them. So we're going to, we're going to dive into it right away. A couple key points I want you to listen for in, in Dylan's talk is um, how to handle experience and commerce layers at the same time. Uh, why creating your software strategy around your team is critical. Uh, Puma's speed of shipping updates and, and making changes has become lightning fast. And he highlights some of the key things that has made it that way. And he highlights what he's most proud about with Puma's approach to how they do commerce. This is a great talk. Let's get into it. Thank you, Joe. Um, I love <laughs> hearing that. Uh, based on everything you laid out is exactly what we've been working towards for several years now. Um, so I'm Dylan Vallade, uh, head of technology for e-commerce at Puma, and I'm in Germany, so Bavaria, Germany, originally from the U.S., and I've been here for six years now helping to basically set up what we've been dreaming of here and talking about, which is this experience platform. My background was consulting, uh, technology consulting, mostly uh, marketing technology and design. And along the way, Puma became a client. They asked if I would come help restructure the way we were doing things at headquarters. And uh, the two main objectives were one, build it smarter than we have it now and tell us when we're being lied to. And really, uh, there wasn't anybody lying, but what was happening is, as Joe, as you said, people weren't honest or understanding about the real capacity of their development teams. So there was this concept that we have developers, they should be able to do whatever we've asked because it's software. And so what we realized was by trying as many ways as possible to kind of take the easy road or the, the less expensive, faster path, we found that we just could not get to where we were trying to. And when we broke it down, what I saw was that we needed to improve the way we were managing the content and we needed to look at site speed. That's still a problem. I think it always will be, but that one was a big driver and then increase the velocity of the user experience and user interface delivery because that's really where every change happens, whether it's 
something to do with security or its design. It's how fast can you get front end changes through? And then the last was prepare for an, a mobile app. We didn't have a shopping app, and so we needed that infrastructure so that we could. Now, if you look at Puma and an e-commerce, we have uh, kind of each of these circles represents a different content management instance. So if we have these three banners from different campaigns or celebrities that we need to publish, if they're going to need to be in all countries, we're going to have to republish that in every one of those circles. And in some cases you have, I said this, the she moves us, that's a brand campaign. There might not even be any product associated with it. You might have a celebrity that's cross-cutting or has a, a date when they start and stop. And then you have the individual products with very specific technology woven into the product itself. When we looked at how do we publish all this, how does it come together? It just frankly gets complicated. And so what we found is we just couldn't do it as fast as we'd like to. So then you start seeing the symptoms, which would be projects that turn into indefinite work, people disappointed because something they promised can't be done, or that the design has almost nothing to do with the actual delivered finished experience. So you end up with people who are disappointed, the consumers are disappointed, the business and marketing teams aren't happy, and that nobody wants to feel stuck like that. What we started down the path of doing was identifying what, what is stable, what can we count on? Let's build up from there. And with the, the desire to move faster meant we need as much automation as we can possibly get. But as Joe said, you can't just buy all of this because we've stitched it together over 75 years making this company. We can't just find somebody who's got off the shelf everything that's built the way we operate. And that's when we started to look at what if we did it ourselves or as much of it as possible ourselves as we could. And I wanted to put on here that this is also buyer beware. Um, if you're ready to jump into this to solve all of your problems, it is a little more complicated than that. And I would recommend the all-in-one DVD player VHS if you really don't have this level of complexity because you will be able to move faster. Even if it's not ideal, you'll be able to be quick if you have something that is less complicated. What I'd like to explain is a bit more on the technical side, how we solve some of these problems. So with any digital transformation or change management, I'm always of the, the mind that you don't want to replace any of the people. And people also don't want to change very much and not very quickly. So what's the one thing we can change? Well, we can mold the software around the people. We already have people publishing content, doing marketing, merchandising, Basically, all of the functions remain. We just want to add this new layer where we publish digital experiences. So when I look at the timeline to make this all happen, we do need to go back six years ago to the beginning, which is the very bottom layer here. Let's standardize all of those source systems before we start leveling up. And that was a lot of work. And that's not really thankful work either because it's not very visual. So it's, it's hard to show it off when you're done. It's just now it finally works better and you can publish to multiple countries at the same time. There's a lot of benefits there. In, in order to then allow all of the different subsidiaries to have their own tech stack, you need to aggregate that before you can share it to any marketplace or to your own .com. So that's where we have this middleware. And beyond that, you start getting into the, the experience layers. And this is where in this transaction layer, storefront services in e-commerce, that's the monolith. That's where you go buy the all-in-one shopping package. And with that, they've bolted on everything you need and you can plug in additional add-ons to cover your bases. We ended up over the years acquiring a bunch of these different services. Along the way, the mock alliance became a thing and people started talking about it as composable, headless, but many of us were already doing that. We just didn't have a term for it. And it wasn't evolved very much. It wasn't a mature ecosystem. So you would buy one, try to put it together with another. They wouldn't quite work. You weren't sure who was, who was right, who was wrong. And so then you added the top one, which is the data and analysis. Now let's try to count it. Let's measure what's going on here and figure out if, is it us? Is it them? 
And what we usually found is it's just hard. <laughs> like all of this is hard. And it was tough to measure. So what we saw was if we're going to have all of those bottom layers displayed on websites and apps, we're going to want a unified API and data model for everything that is Puma. So now, even though we don't have the celebrity ambassadors in our source product systems in those databases, we're going to need it when we show it on the website of the app. So then in this purple area, our project was codenamed Cybercat. We started to have to build that out. And that's what we're seeing that we evolve now. And, and so it looks like Forrester is seeing the same thing that you can't buy it all. You have to build some of this if you really want to structure it to be effective for you. When we identified what tools to use and where we needed to go, we started with um, like Stack Overflow does an annual review of all of the technologies that developers are using. You can see what software they want, what they use, what they don't like, what's emerging. And from there, we could tell that there was a few things were absolutely winning. TypeScript was one of them. Uh, React is doing well. GraphQL. These were the things that were they're open source, they're, they're understood, and they bring a lot of the benefits of the legacy software systems that the monoliths are built on. Um, a lot of them are built on Java, it has strict typing. When you compile it, it's, you know what you're getting. TypeScript brings that to the, the web, to the front end world. And so you got to get a lot more developer ergonomics, which makes their life easier, which makes them much more able to do good work for you. So once we gave them the tools that they needed and the freedom, they were able to build exactly what they had wanted to build for other clients, solve the problems they've had. And what we were able to then do is set up exactly what we wanted. And now we have the ability to move fast. So the, the way I look at this now is when we want to ask for a change, and I can say, for example, we were in a call today. Somebody said, I'd like to try this vendor. And we said, actually, we have a relationship with them we aren't using that feature. What if we turned it on? That sounds good. Basically, by the time the call was closed, we already had a commit made in GitHub. The pull request was being reviewed by developers. By the time we were all finished talking about it and people had gotten a cup of coffee, it's on its way to production. We were nowhere near that two years ago. It would have been, well, we never could have released faster than weekly. There was often two weeks was the cadence. Those were the things I was looking at after Actually, I was given the book Accelerate. And if you haven't read it, that's a really good one. And with that, you'll see that enterprises that move fast, as Joe said, there's there's the one side, which is if you're customer obsessed, you start moving in a direction that helps you win in the market. That is not my personal strength. So I rely on others to understand what the customer needs. My job is to figure out how do we deliver it quickly. So what I'm looking at is Basically, what's the the lead time to get changes into production? And essentially, how fast are we we deploying? If it's once a week, I have a maximum of 52 releases the whole year. If it's once a day, or now we're over 300. If it's multiple times a day, now we can move quickly. And that's where we were able to get to. But it was painful to get there. We were finally able to do it. And now I can see that the outcome is we can basically deliver on the dreams that people have had when it came to digital experience that before you just couldn't. And that really was, there's nothing more that a technology team can deliver to an organization than the capability to move fast, allow people to be creative, and at the same time have secure checkout, allow you to add payment methods, allow you to toggle them on and off when one's failing. Those are now all of the functions of this purple layer for us, of that DXP, but um, for us, it's it's the front end. And I, I would strongly encourage people to go down this path. It starts with education. Uh, those of us who have done it are happy to talk about it. We want you to avoid stepping in the same messes that we did. Uh, the first things that I would say is the, the cloud infrastructure will cost more than you think, but in ways you didn't expect. So once you start moving out of that monolith structure where it's all baked in and you start actually owning the responsibility for some of it, it'll spike in ways that now you'll understand why the pricing model they gave you exists. So you are going to need some buffer there. API management is key. And that I think goes right into the skill set that you were identifying. If you don't have 
skills to really um, monitor, run, evaluate APIs and build them, you're going to struggle. And if you're not ready to do that, I would say don't even get started yet. But one thing that's great now is that you can buy into an ecosystem of people that know how to do this well. And that's where the mock alliance is really good. You can step in there and just start talking to people. Because everyone is using similar technologies now, and this has matured quickly in the last, I don't know, five, six years, you, you've got a pretty safe bet. All of these are very similar. You want to find out which ones work together best, though. There's usually two or three or four that, like, they're kind of grouping together. And so you end up in these little pockets of, of really talented people that work really well together. And, and I think the last thing to, that I would want to point out is that this is not easy, and it takes a lot of convincing. You have to constantly be helping people through some dark times. It'll be architects. It'll be product managers. It'll be the, the business leads. Everybody is used to the way they've been working for a long time. You're going to unlock something for them, but it's going to take more time than you'd like. And people are going to be disappointed along the way. But when you get to the other end, I mean, we did a hackathon a couple of weeks ago, and I've never been more proud of the team and the work that we've done in my whole life. It was insane to see what could be done in 24 hours that in the past would have taken us 24 months. And it is just remarkable what's possible. But it was really because we took the time to build what we needed ourselves, buy the rest, and then get the give everyone the time to settle into it. Okay, that was fantastic. Now, next up, and our last guest is Tovi Hilbron. He is the Director of Digital Product and Experience at Harry Rosen. And as a side note, Harry Rosen uses bolts to power checkout in their composable stack. So selfishly, it's it's been really neat being along in their journey from moving from a monolith to now a fully composable stack and watching how they approached it, the decisions they made along the way. But I think most importantly, we've had a front row seat to the amazing results they've seen to their sales, their conversion rates, their average order size. It's it's really been fun to watch. Since going to this, this approach, and they've been open about these results, they've seen a 400% increase in digital sales, four nines, 99.99% uptime, a 500% increase in online sales through their unique closing advisor relationships, and many other positive stats. There's a ton to learn from from Tovi and Harry Rosen. And, you know, even though they are a 70-year-old iconic brand, they are leading the way in the digital shopping experience they offer to their customers. And honestly, quite frankly, they are more innovative than a lot of quote-unquote younger modern brands. Uh, Tovi was actually even gracious, uh, gracious enough to share the composable tech stack that powers Harry Rosen. And I know this is an audio podcast, but if you head to our podcast page at boldcommerce.com slash podcast, and I'll make sure to put it in the show notes as well, uh, you can view the PDF with, with all of those details. It's worth a peek. As I mentioned, they went through a lot in determining the best approach, so it's worth seeing their, their end results. Okay, a few key points to listen for in this talk is how do you lead in digital strategy when when retail is so critical to your business remember they have 70 years of retail um, how do you specifically digitize what makes you unique how do you invest in digital technology for the long term not just a short term but how do you think long term and they are a long-term thinking company um, and lastly how do you say yes to more things than you say no to and Harry Rosen has figured a lot of this out and they're going to share it. Um, this is a great one to finish on. Let's let's get right into it. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Toby Helbron. I'm the Director of Digital Product and Experience at Harry Rosen. So um, just a bit of context for you before I get rolling. Harry Rosen is a almost 70-year-old Canadian luxury menswear apparel retailer. Um, it's a third generation run family business, and there's about 18 stores across Canada, and we have a few digital properties as well. So uh, I'm going to break, break down my little spiel here into three sections. The first is, how did we get here? What's our from two states? The second is, how we're thinking about checkouts currently? And the third is some shared experience for those who are either contemplating or getting started on their own composable journeys. So with section one, uh, prelude to going composable, what's the setup here for Harry Rosen? For us, it really comes down to four situations to share. The first was 
if you can divide our organization from the tech side to the business side, e-commerce was seen as laggards in the eyes of the business. And what I mean is they would typically fork over requirements and say, okay, can you do this? And then we'd have to come back and say either, no, we can't, or we can do it in a really long time, or let's just whittle down what you actually want. And in the end, nobody would be happy. The second point is e-com was seen as dilutive to in-store support. Because Harry Rosen is historically an in-store experience, it's an in-store retailer, what I and the digital side of the house is trying to develop was seen as dilutive from other functions trying to support the business. They were thinking of supporting the business by supporting the in-store experience. The third point there is we had a very fragile calcified code base. Whatever we tried to do was excruciatingly difficult. And it wasn't because we had the wrong people. We had the right people. There was just so much effort spent towards entropy just to keep the lights on, so to speak. We couldn't actually expand or extend on what we were trying to do. And the last is infrastructure that couldn't scale. Having uh, marketing pushes was almost a scary event for us because uh, you just see, you know, red lines going up and we just were trying to keep everything stable as opposed to getting hot and overloading. And so we were confronted with these four problem statements. How might we avoid the endless cycle of needing upgrades to deliver value? We were always chasing after the next release. We were always being told, oh, if you go on to version next, that's when your business really gets unlocked. How might we invest confidently in digital technologies for the long term? The tech that we had was very prescribed in how it was meant to be used. How might we say yes to ideas more than no? We had good people, and yet it wasn't for lack of trying that we could not have them actually express their capabilities and express their creativity digitally. And we wanted to be able to say to the business, yes, we can, as opposed to, no, we can't, or later, or after we do these things. The last um, statement was, how might we digitize what makes us unique? Shopping at Hair Rosen can be a magical experience, but historically that magic was only ever unlocked in store. And yet, if you went onto our website, it just represented sameness. There was none of that Hair Rosen uniqueness digitally. And so, uh, from Mar roughly March 2020 until August of 2020, we essentially scrapped all of the tech that supported our .com, and this is what we went live with. So this was like um, graduating class, if you will, of our mock ecosystem. Uh, and then it's evolved since, where we've plugged in an additional client, if you will, a different uh, .com. This is Erosen's off-price business called Shop Final Cuts. And this here is Herringbone, which is our internal clientele application. It's almost like the corollary of clients shopping online uh, in an unassisted fashion. This middle layer here uh, is really all of our composable pieces that actually stitch together the unified client experience digitally. Um, but under the hood, this is really what it looks like more. I mean, um, Obviously, this is simplified, if you'd believe it, but um, I'm not going to talk through all these arrows. It's not the point. If you actually just blur your eyes for a moment, I think I want to express here a slight nuance, which almost took me a while to figure out. But this layer here, which I've called web service, everything in here represents headless. Right? It's all of these different pieces that when you stitch them together, they're projected up for these clients, right? These three applications. Any of the arrows that you see that connecting any of these nodes within this layer, that's the composability. That represents composable versus headless. So just as we can have commerce tools in the unified discounting engine, which our POS, the in-store POS calls into, for an in-store transaction, or just as when a client searches online, we can give them results that are both product as well as content. So we have an integration between Algolia, which indexes editorial content that's actually published in Ampliance, or um, Algolia servicing up client records into Herringbone, and that gets serviced up from our CRM and our CDP or even commerce tools and login radius needing to do a handshake 
when a client authenticates themselves online. Um, those are just a few examples, of course. Okay, so what's the business impact of us doing all this? A couple points here. Um, even though the business holistically, Harry Rosen, the enterprise has grown revenue from 2019 to 2022, uh, full years, of course, um, the contribution of digital sales in that mix has grown 400%. Uh, in terms of our digital properties, we've got basically a four nines uptime over two and a half years. We're now doing a production release on average, again, over two and a half years, once every three days. Uh, so the releases themselves are smaller, only five to 10 items per, but we're doing them much more frequently. So that's the agility piece. 50% of work items are features and features, it's a tight definition. It's something that either the external customer or our internal customers, like our uh, selling advisors, get, val get direct value from. So because we're able to express that half of the development effort goes towards features, it gives the business confidence to literally triple down on the investments they're making in digital because they literally see the value they're getting for it. Uh, the third last point, we're now able to better tell the story of the value of the products we sell, like the, the garments, the merchandise we sell. Um, and so the dot-com does not become just like a clearinghouse. It's somewhere where we can actually tell that story well because of the tech and because of the people using that tech. And uh, there's also a high crossover in Omni clients. We call them Omni clients. So clients that traditionally used to only shop in store now actually can have a Harry Rosen-like experience shopping digitally. And so seeing that crossover, it's a very healthy metric for us to track because if we see cust our customers shopping across more channels, their customer lifetime value goes up. And the last point here is marketing spend is managed. Practically what I mean by that is the marketing team is now able to develop assets, whether it's uh, creative shots or editorial content and deploy those across different contexts, across different applications. And so they're able to essentially amortize that spend longer and further. Okay, that's for section one. Section two, talking about checkout a bit. So um, if you think of checkout as there's a fixed sequence in how one gets to checkout and then there's also a fixed sequence of how one goes through checkout from beginning to end and we're trying to think along the terms of how can we make that more fluid both how you approach it and how you go through it and also how do you make checkout something that occurs more in the background it shouldn't be like a cool i found this product that inspires me and i'm motivated to buy it but oh, uh, I have to go through checkout now, right? Like it's almost a relief when you get through it feeling unscathed. So one expression of how we're actually trying to do things a bit differently, Harry Rosen, not all customers shop with a clothing advisor as we call them, but those who do tend to get more out of the brand. Now, these client advisor relationships tend to be very meaningful, long lasting, and there's a lot of trust built within them. So here, um, this is something powered by Commerce Tools shopping lists. And it's essentially a, well, it's a personalized shopping list that say my advisor, Ashley, has assembled for me. If, if one was to scroll down the page, it would look more like this. So it's a personalized shopping list that she has put together for me uh, with some inspirational shots. And you know, there's the Amalfi Coast back there and her contact info is there. And all of these products, it's not just the product itself that she's curated for me because she knows me. She's also picked the actual sizes. So essentially, she's brought me quite far down funnel, closer to the act of converting itself. So we're taking someone essentially right through the website to say, don't bother looking at everything. These are the things that you've asked for. These are the things that only you need. And all I have to do is essentially hit the that add all to cart button and then proceed to checkout. But once you actually get to checkout, what we're now actually testing out on our production site is Bold's what they call headless checkout, which essentially means that essentially it being somewhere where you drop off the client and they go through checkout in a prescribed linear way, we now can start experimenting with if-then statements. 
So if the customer has these attributes or if the cart or if the session has these certain attributes, we can take them through checkout in a different manner. So for example, to layer onto this Ashley Toby um, interaction here, the advisor could potentially set up checkout where my address and my payment info is already there. And essentially all I have to do is not start checkout, but just hit complete order. We're trying to directionally take the customer to that point. So last section, what's the point? So this is the lessons learned that I wanna share with um, those who are in attendance right now. Um, for us, the point of going composable really comes down to these points, the, the bullet points here. Going composable truly unlocks omni-channel journeys. So just as the POS can call into our commerce engine online to um, orchestrate discounts across the enterprise, so too clients going in-store can have a digitally enriched in-store experience. So whatever they leave behind from online, so if it's their orders or their customer persona, or their loyalty records, all that can be available wherever the customer is. So it becomes much more a conversation where it's just about the brand and the customer unimpeded by technological or organizational silos. The point of going composable is that enables business users. So formerly all of the tech sat on the tech side of the house. But now it's almost like the curtain has been lowered or opened that it gives me no greater pleasure that a business user outside of tech is now using our search engine or using our content management system and they're finding ways of using it and expressing their own creativity and their own capabilities in ways that I could not have imagined. It's also allowed us to create a product organization. So. Formerly, we used to hire for very tactical roles like front-end dev, back-end dev, um, business analyst, project manager. But now, because we're moving so much faster, we have this void where, that we're trying to fill in for product managers that can sit between the tech side of the house and the business so that we're unifying these two disparate sides of the house to better express what we're trying to do strategically. Layering on that, we have value stream management. So a specific, pro the way we're thinking about it and building out our teams, a specific product manager would own a value stream. And a value stream, as an example, would be commerce and transactions. So anything that happens from when a client starts a cart until an order is fulfilled. And underneath that value stream are a suite of tools, right? Um, Second last point, there's a shared language between the business and tech. So I don't have to talk to the business stakeholders about story points or epics or like super techie things like that. I can talk to them about time to value, velocity, um, and where their money is going. And they can see that expressed in terms of metrics that I can share with them on a weekly basis. And the last is tighter coordination across the enterprise. So because we've gone composable and because we can move so much faster, if you think of that, when I say moving so much faster, that's just local optimization. That's just the lead time of taking something from your backlog to production. But now what we can do in terms of coordination is optimize across the entire um, thought process from idea to cash. Right, So it's the business and the tech side of the house working really, really closely, more than we ever have in the past, to optimize for business agility, not just tech agility. So how do you, last slide here. How do you know you're ready? This is uh, for those who are curious about doing something like this. From my, shared, from my own experience, I would say that there's really five things to consider. First is you should have a vision. People need to know where you're going. It's not just about having cooler features or releasing features faster. It's about doing business differently, doing your job differently. And people need to be bought into that. They need to know where they're going. Second point is executive sponsorship. It's going to be hard. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, it, you shouldn't think that, but um, you need to have, it's very important that in terms of prioritization conflicts, 
you have someone at the highest level of the organization backing you up to say, no, no, protect this, protect this work stream, protect these people's work to actually deliver on the promise. Don't let that get compromised. And to protect that, you need to have the protection at the highest levels of the organization. The third is talent. Have the right people to do this work. Um, whether it's in-house or out of house, you'll find the model that works for you. Um, and think perhaps a little bit more open-mindedly. Don't think about developers who only work in a specific tool. Think about developers who can work in a certain framework and that framework can be applied across the new tools. Second last point is focus and then focus more. What I mean by that is simplify your requirements. Don't expect that the way that you currently do things is exactly how you will be doing things in the future. Be open to questioning the business, questioning sacred cows, questioning if things always used to work that way, if they have to keep working that way. And the last thing is build progressively. Um, this doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't have to happen quickly. Um, it never ends. And it also allows you to be compassionate on your team that you're not trying to do too much too soon. So that also speaks to risk mitigation. Um, so it's a bit of a very worthwhile journey for us so far. This is just the Harry Rosen story. And uh, I appreciate everybody's attention here. Thank you. Okay, well, that's it for this week's episode. I, I really hope you enjoyed it. You know, this, this podcast was a bit uh, different than others and, and generally our podcast is not geared to be promotional but I think with this episode I, I want to say this if anything you heard today sparked an interest for you or if you'd like to learn more about the advantages of composable commerce and if it makes sense and how it maybe might help your brand this is exactly what we do at Bold we, we offer the only mock certified fully composable checkout that lets some of the best brands in the world create amazing checkout experiences anywhere in any commerce stack in a way that makes sense for their business. They don't have to fit into the box of their e-commerce platform that tells them checkout should be done a certain way. We let them completely own it. Own your checkout, own your commerce. That's it for this week. If you enjoyed this episode and, and got anything from it, would you consider leaving a five-star review? It would mean a lot. Appreciate it in advance and we'll see you next week.